Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael, and I work for Pengotronics at the graphics stack. So I will be talking today about mod the modern Linux graphics stack on embedded systems. For that, we will first have a look at a typical modern Linux user interface. So that's a modern user interface. <laughs> Just kidding. Usually, modern interfaces look like this, KDE, the Plasma Window Manager, or GNOME with all different kinds of applications. And um, that's a typical desktop use case. On the desktop, you just choose some um, desktop environment like KDE or GNOME, install it, and your graphical user interface just works. I put this in quotes, but it just works. So um, what is different in embedded systems? And that's what we will, or I will be talking today. The agenda is like follows. Um, I will start with a look at the modern Linux graphics stack. Then, especially on graphics in embedded systems and what's so special about it. And finally, on Western on embedded systems, uh, on embedded graphics. So let's start with the Linux graphics stack. Usually it starts with a windowing system. Um, you have a display server that takes care of the display and manages multiple applications, windows. Um, and these applications talk to um, the display server using a sp um, specific prot protocol or protocols. Um, this has been for 30 years or even more, um, the X11 protocol. I just put the XORG here because it's the most commonly used implementation, but it's uh, the X11 protocols. In a more modern use case, you will use Wayland for that. Um, and the remainder of the talk will be um, more about Wayland. So it, as I said, it starts with your display server. In Wayland, it's called a Wayland compositor. The UI of the compositor is usually called shell. Um, so we have the Wayland compositor here. Um, on top of that, we have multiple applications that um, use the protocols. In Wayland, a typical protocol is the XDG um, shell protocol, um, which allows to create windows and has um, this different functionality, right? like resizing, maximizing, dragging, and all these things you would expect from uh, your desktop. Um, you can have different applications and different um, graphic toolkits for that. For example, Qt and GTK both sub support the Wayland protocol, especially uh, the XDG, XDG shell protocol. And um, Chromium as well. So if you are using an HTML um, application, you can run it on Chromium on Wayland. Um, below that, um, your compositor somehow has to use the display. For that, it uses libdrm, um, some DRM driver in the kernel, and that drives the display. So, um, exactly. Um, here comes um, the DRM and especially KMS into play. Um, Wayland uses OpenGL for compositing the different applications together. For that, it uses um, Mesa and um, some GPU driver and actually GPU hardware below that to make it really fast. Um, it can also add animations um, and transparency so your windows can pop in or burn if you close them. Um, so that's more or less the graphics stack. If your client uses OpenGL as well, it bypasses the um, compositor and uses Mesa directly. Um, that's something that's different in Wayland than it was in X11. So um, the output of your client belongs to the client. It renders into it and passes this output to the compositor, which then creates the final um, frame. So as um, final overview, we have the clients that render their surface, 
the compositor composites it together and then um, forwards it to the display driver which displays it. Um, any questions so far? I hope not. <laughs> so um, now we, if you go to embedded, what is different about embedded? Maxim already said some um, points of these. So we have limited hardware resources, especially we have a limited memory bandwidth and all the different hardware resources use the memory. So um, the more res um, hardware resources we are using, the less memory bandwidth we have left. So that's really the constraining factor. And in many cases, we have a limited power, um, uh, yeah, limited power, so we are battery driven and so um, usually you have different hardware accelerators for your graphics, um, like GPUs, video decoders, and display. So um, yeah, the GPU for 3D hardware acceleration, display controllers, as here you have especially different overlays, um, hardware overlays, which can be used. So you don't have to composite in your compositor, but you just put your output to different overlays and it's composited in your display controller. And you have these hardware video encoders and decoders to, um, to um, not put that much, um, to not use your CPU for that and waste energy. And um, if you buy an SOC, usually you get um, IP cores from different vendors, so your SOC vendor buys IP cores from different IP vendors, puts them together in an SOC, and uses them. That leads to um, maybe incompatible um, as, um, IP cores. So one outputs um, memory that is specifically aligned, which is not compatible with another IP core, or uses a spe special tiling or a proprietary tiling. Um, and then you sometimes even have um, special hardware units for translating between this, the tiling of one um, IP core to another or between uh, pixel format from one IP core to another. So um, we have all these peculiarities of the embedded hardware. Now, um, if you take an application developer or designer that is used to desktop development, it's, he's used to um, just um, develop on the desktop, see a window of the final um, application, um, and he's not aware of the hardware limitations. Hopefully you talk to him that he should be aware, but not necessarily the case. So can we somehow um, achieve the convenience of developing an application on a desktop for embedded systems? Um, for that, our graphics stack must um, optimally use the graphics hardware while um, the drivers um, support um, or provide proper abstractions of this hardware. The user space uses it, but your application developer does not need to care or does not have to care about all, this, all of this. And um, now I will have a look at the uh, abstractions that the drivers provide um, for user space. So there is the Linux DMA buff framework. Um, the DMA buffs allow to share buffers between different drivers. So one driver exports the buffer, another one imports it. And this allows to avoid copies between the client and the compositor. And um, this is really important to save memory bandwidth. Um, a second um, abstraction is the atomic mode setting. Um, if you want to use overlay planes of your hardware and you um, put your frame on one after the other, you might get in between states where you have um, the old state on one plane and the new state on the other plane. So you want to change all at once. 
and that's um, possible with atomic mode setting. Um, and this allows for the compositor to really make use of um, all the different hardware planes because it just um, sets up the new state and sends it to the display hardware and it's there in one instance. The third uh, um, is video and pixel formats. So usually in video decoders, um, you have a YUV format, which is completely different from RGB formats that are typically used by display units. So if you um, render, um, you usually convert these formats to something that the display understands. But um, some display controllers might even understand YUV formats or even different custom formats. Like I said before, IP cores understand um, strange formats or your hardware, um, <laughs> your hardware has some converter built in to translate this. So um, this is also um, provided by the drivers. So drivers tell you what they support. And um, furthermore, you have tiling formats which allow to save memory bandwidth by um, reordering the pixels of your frame and um, having a better um, cache, um, better cache accesses. Um, this is described by um, format modifiers and this allows to um, share um, buffers with a specific tiling between hardware units. So if your video decoder produces some proprietary tiling format and your driver provides a modifier for that and your display controller provides a modifier for um, that it understands this proprietary tiling format, um, Western might be able to just pass the buffer to the display unit. Um, display controller. So um, from the driver side, we have all these features, but does user space actually um, use these features? For that, we will have a look at Weston. Weston is the reference implementation of Wayland Compositor. And as we see here um, in the readme, it explicitly states that it's useful for embedded industrial applications and um, for um, kiosks. So that might be a useful um, application that we can use in uh, our embedded system. Furthermore, um, if you look into Weston, we see the DRM backend, which uses the Linux KMS API. So it's exactly using the displays or the DRM drivers for the displays. And um, if we look into the MAM page for that, it's again stating that it's able to use hardware overlays. And what's very interesting is that full screen surfaces will be scanned out directly without compositing. So we might even be able to save uh, um, using or to avoid using the GPU for our compositing here, which again saves mem memory bandwidth. So um, now I will change the pace a bit, so don't be scared of the slides. There will be code on it. You don't have to read it. You don't have to understand it. If you download the slides from the web from the thingy, um, you can have a look at it, look for the functions, and read it by yourself in the code. So that's much better than trying to follow me here. So um, first, um, if we prepare the planes, so that's when the compositor asks the display hardware controller for the supported planes. We can see that it does a DRM get uh, mode get property blob and reads um, formats and modifiers from the blob. So it's aware of um, what the display controller is supporting. The second step is the rendering. So we have render the rendering um, separated from our flushing to the hardware. And the flushing um, actually does a uh, DRM, atomic, uh, DRM mode atomic commit. So Weston uses the um, atomic commit AP, API for DRM, so it can directly change all the planes at once. 
then I want you. Um, you can see here, um, at one step in the compositing, it, uh, the uh, Weston assigns different plane, um, assigns um, the plane state, and it tries different modes here, once with planes only, then it tries to use planes and um, com uh, compositing in the renderer, and if all fails, it renders everything together. And um, in the proposed state, it, um, you can see here that it first tries to prepare um, the scan out view, uh, and afterwards um, the overlay, and if this, so it tries to put a surface on the um, overlay, on the scan out and then the overlay, and if this fails, it just adds it to the renderer region, which will be rendered together. Um, the final um, part is, can we actually um, directly get um, the buffers from clients um, into our compositor or to flip it furthermore on the overlay. And that is done in the DRM FB get from view function. Um, where you can see that it tries to um, get one from, if it gets a DMA buff, it tries to get a DM, DRM FB from that. And it's all actually there. So all of this you can find in the libwesten compositor drm.c file. It's pretty large, so look up these functions and they will help you through that file. So as a um, conclusion of that, we have seen that the DMA buff import is supported by Weston. Mo atomic mode set is supported. We can use overlay planes because of that. And we also have a format modifiers, so we know that um, buffers have a specific tiling format. What doesn't work is um, if we get uh, specifically a tiled um, client buffer and want to put it on an output plane, Weston currently doesn't understand this and the um, um, GBM API doesn't provide means to do so yet. Yes, so that's about um, how Weston uses um, the DRM APIs. As a final step, we will now look into how we build a user interface with Weston. Um, so as I said before, the user interface is defined by, the West, by a Weston shell. Um, if you replace the DRM backend by the Wayland backend, or if you're using an X-based system by the X backend, X11 backend, then you can develop this uh, Western shell on your desktop PC, which is again a point for um, user interface designer, designers. And to actually test it, you have to um, run on your um, hardware and use the DRM backend for that. So you won't be able to test the DRM features on your desktop PC. Um, in order to write a desktop uh, Western shell, you go to the um, western.ini configuration file. There you have a shell property and there you can put your own shell um, as a string. Behind the string will be an um, executable object file. Um, which is um, loaded by Weston. Um, so you, and in this loadable object file, you implement the XDG shell protocol, and then you use libweston to actually talk to the compositor. Um, this looks like this. So you have some application. Um, and the application speaks the XDG shell protocol with your shell, and your shell then uses um, functions defined in libwesten compositor.h to talk to libwesten, which does then all this magic stuff with the uh, DRM. Um, so again, a bit of code. The entry function to your um, object 
is, needs to be called wet shell init. So if you have this function, this will be the first function that is called by Weston when it loads the shell. And um, at one point, you call Weston compositor schedule repaint, then it will um, repaint the current state of, um, yeah, the, so the final frame for uh, output. Um, you need to do a, a lot of stuff in between. So if you want some examples on how to do that, you can go to the Western sources. There you have an example desktop shell implementation, which is for a desktop use case. Then you have the IVI shell implementation, which is for um, an in-vehicle infotainment use case. And you have the full screen shell, which um, is for a single application that runs in full screen. So, wait. Um, in vehicle infotainment sounds a lot like um, an embedded use case. So we might just use this IVI shell for, um, uh, for our embedded system. So um, the IVI shell is exactly for the embedded or HMI use case. Um, this um, allows the compositor more control about the surfaces from clients. It identifies clients by a specific ID and knows which um, surface belongs to which client. And um, the uh, problem with the IVI shell is it um, supports the IVI application and protocol for, uh, to be able to specify these IDs. So, the XDG shell is not supported and all your common applications and all your, um, all the graphic toolkits won't work on the IVI shell. So, but um, there is a patch set on the Wayland um, devil mailing list for adding um, the, the XDG shell protocol to the IVI shell. So if you use this um, patch set, you can just run normal, applic normal applications on um, the IVI shell. So that makes the IVI shell again interesting for an embedded use case. So we have a look at the IVI shell to know what we have to do. Um, we have some um, IVI, um, the IVI shell um, implementation, which um, implements this, the shell protocol. So the IVI application protocol or the XDG shell protocols are implemented here. This again uses the IVI layout library, which takes care of all the surfaces and different layers that allow you to manage your um, client applications. And this library talks to your compositor backend. In order to um, create a user interface with that, you additionally have this HMI controller. Um, this is responsible for um, positioning your surfaces, um, how they relate to each other, and on top of that, you can have a user interface that looks like this, for example. So this is the example user interface that comes with Weston, the no, IVI shell. So in order to have our own user interface, we just cut here and replace the HMI controller and this user interface and reuse this IVI layout library. Um, this library um, exports uh, uh, API called the IVI layout. So in your HMI controller, you um, call this IVI layout get API. You will get an IVI layout interface. And on this interface, you are able to create surfaces, position these surfaces, um, add the surfaces to various layers, and do your um, user interface implementation. Once you've configured your interface, you do a commit changes, which will then trigger the repaint and update your frames. Um. That's basically how you um, implement an HMI controller for the IVI shell. 
So, um, are there any alternatives to Weston? Yes, there are. There are the WL Roots um, project and the Cute Valen Compositor, which are the most prominent from my point of view. First, a look at the WL Roots um, um, project. So, it's a modular Valen Compositor <coughs> library. Again, um, uh, it has an interesting protocol, which is the um, WLR layer shell unstable v1 protocol, which allows um, clients to um, specify anchors and uh, um, positions in the, on the final composited frame. So this might be also interesting for um, writing such a user interface for an embedded system. Um, it's currently used by Sway, by the Fosh for the Librem 5, and by Rootsen, which is the example um, compositor for that, and several more that I'm not aware of. And um, the problem with WL Roots is it does not support overlay planes yet, and it does not support the format modifiers. So it is interesting from the application developer point of view, but it's not yet suited for using it in an embedded system. And then there is the Qt Valent Compositor. It's a Qt module um, for developing display servers, so exactly what we need. It provides a QML um, interface, which makes it really simple to write a compositor, and um, someone who writes applications already in QML, writing a compositor with QML is really easy. And therefore, um, as it uses QML, it's a pretty well-tested declarative um, technology there. Um, the problem with a Qt Wayland compositor is it does not use atomic mode set, um, and therefore it cannot use overlay planes and it um, cannot use the format modifiers and it's also difficult to, or it's not that performant to use it in an embedded use case. So um, there come my open questions that I still not sure um, how, if there is a an proper answer for that. So first, is it really useful to have a desktop environment for the UI developers of the embedded systems, or does it maybe hurt more if we make it development easy on a desktop and then switch to an embedded system and everything falls apart? Um, therefore, should, um, furthermore, should the compositor really hide the hardware complexity? So if everything happens magically, generically over several systems in the compositor, the developer does not have that much control um, uh, or the developer might know that something uses less bandwidth if, it does, if he does it differently. So is it really good to have everything in the compositor or do we want to have more control from applications? Furthermore, in the, or in the compositor, who decides what shall be rendered, what shall be put on um, the overlay planes? Is it more efficient to render everything together? Is it more efficient to have one single application on an overlay? I don't know, and I'm not sure if it can be decided for all use cases. And, um, should we provide means for clients um, or client applications to decide their position? Or should the compositor decide for all clients where they should be put? So if we have like a, a notification and should the application that shows the notification decide where to put it or is it the compositor who decides? I'm also not sure about that. So, um, with that, I come to the um, summary. First, um, I looked at the Linux graphics stack, including Wayland on top, Mesa and DRM um, for um, 3D um, acceleration and for interfacing with display controllers. Then I especially looked at the abstraction that DRM provides um, 
for the peculiarities of the embedded hardware and how, to, how it can be efficiently used. Then how Western uses these DRM features and where you can find it in the Western code. And finally, how to build an embedded UI with Western using the, um, so building your own shell or using the IBI shell for that. So with that, if you have any questions, remarks, opinions, answers, then um, talk to me tomorrow at the Pengotronics booth. Um, write me an email or just find me at the conference and talk to me. I will be happy to talk about these things. So thank you for your attention and yeah, thanks. Any questions or answers now? Um, there are microphones on the side. Uh, hi. Uh, is there any backwards compatibility between different uh, shell versions? Because uh, you were presenting slides of creating a new shell for mm -hmm. Western, and it has a variable name. It was a num named like version six, unstable something, mm. so. Um, mm, I'm not sure, I don't think so, but I'm not really sure. So for the XDG shell, it's finally stable. So that's a stable protocol. Um, I used the unstable one um, because it's from the examples I copied and cut together. Um, I don't know, actually. Okay, for example, uh, if I have latest Western and I use an application which uses like uh, shell protocol version two, will it work? Um, I have to try, sorry. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, I don't see any further questions. Then thanks again and have a nice lunch.